No? <laughs> Perfect. So if you're just joining me on this recording, welcome. Um, we are looking at kids and their food. I'm Dr. Sally Bell, your host tonight. I'm just about to introduce the wonderful Lucinda Miller, um, who's a naturopath and has clinics um, around the country in the UK, uh, looking at child's health and women's health. Um, and it's just a joy to be able to combine, you know, our skill, me as a conventional medic, her with her naturopathic medicine um, and functional medicine training to answer your questions around your kids. Um, and I just, before I introduce, I just want to say that, uh, you know, we're all here to sort of learn off each other. I'm learning off Lucinda. I'm going to be taking notes. There's so many questions I want to ask if you don't ask. Um, but I'm going to ask her some questions to begin with, and then there's an opportunity for you to put your questions um, in the chat. Now, if you're not familiar with Zoom, um, if you want us to be bigger, you need to hover over our pictures and just put pin and that will make us bigger. There's a chat box at the bottom. If you pop your um, questions in there, Francesca is going to have a look at those and I'm going to try and follow some of that as well so we can feed some of these questions to Lucinda and to myself and, and answer some of those questions. So Lucinda, welcome. Um, please just tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into your work. Sally, it's fantastic to be here and so many people online, it's amazing. Um, so well done for pulling in such a crowd. Um, so yes, I'm, I've been a naturopath for quite a long time, but I've also been a mum for nearly 20 years. I've got three kids. And I guess when I first started training, I assumed that I'd see adults and I did for ages. And it was really when I started to have my kids, I realized that there was very, very little information on children's nutrition and how to really help them flourish. Um, and so I got really into it, but of course this was really in the early days of the internet. So it was all kind of quite sort of difficult to access. And there were a few books, but not, not much. Um, but anyway, so I did my best, you know, when they were little and I tried to, you know, cook from scratch and I tried to get them organic food if I could and tried to get them lots of fish oils and things like that. And they were doing pretty well. Um, but yeah, my son, my eldest, um, he always had sort of very loose nappies, basically, lots of punamis. Um, and, you know, I used to, I went to the GP a couple of times, but they said they're fine. There's no blood, there's no mucus, he's fine. And anyway, he did really well in reception at school. And um, then in sort of year one, things started, you know, the wheels started falling off. And, you know, they were saying, well, we think that he might be dyspraxic, we think he might be ADD. He's got a tick, you know, he hasn't made any friends. And, you know, he was also having disasters in the pants area too and having lots of accidents. So, you know, we had a load of things going on and, you know, obviously that impacted on the whole family. It, it, we just found it all really, really tough. Um, and I thought, well, you know, I've tried so many different things and his tummy is still not right. And I'm sure there's a connection. There's a massive connection between the gut and the brain. Um, Anyway, I actually went to an autism conference um, and he wasn't autistic, but he did have, you know, funny little traits. And I went actually because I was looking after a couple of kids with autism and I thought I need to do better for them. And there were all these doctors from around the world there and lots of amazing parents. And the stories were just incredible. These kids were, you know, turning from being aggressive or nonverbal or not sleeping or gut issues or whatever to being much happier and healthier and thriving and developing in, in a more positive way. And I thought, gosh, if they can do that for their kids, I can do that for my son. Um, so I, and this is really where I got into functional medicine. So basically on the Monday, I ordered up lots of tests. So I did a proper stool test, um, way more than the NHS or even a private doctor could do in the UK right now. Um, and a urine test to check all his metabolites and nutrition and hair test check his minerals and whether there were any toxins in his environment and stuff like that and um anyway lots of things came back and it's too much detail to go you know to exactly what came up but basically we started working on his gut and we started to get the toxins out of his system and literally within a week he came downstairs one morning and he said mummy my brain's not playing hide and seek anymore i can concentrate and it was really sweet. It was like this wow moment where he was seemed to be really organised and together rather than sort of dippy and half sleep. It was really exciting. And his tics started going away and he started making friends and his 
you know, his bowels were behaving better and just everything came together. And it was just so exciting to see him really progress in all areas of his life and be happier. Yeah. Um, anyway, he's now nearly 20 years old. He's at a very good university, um, lots of lovely friends, and he's a delightful young man. He's actually, we have an online shop selling vitamins and supplements and things, and he's been packing boxes pretty much for the last year. So he's been here doing that, and he's he's amazing at that. So, you know, he's a really good lad now, and it's yeah. just exciting to see that he's progressed into, yeah, this, you know, very easygoing he never gets a cold he occasionally gets a bit of hay fever but that's his only niggle he get you know a yeah. couple of months a year he needs some support but other than that he's really healthy and it's great so that um, and then shifted your interest to children and and then how did that that led you into absolutely um and then actually my daughter who was our, who is our very sporty healthy bright sparky one who's always been very easy um when she was about eight she got bitten by a tick and she developed Lyme's disease. Wow. And obviously we were very lucky. We got good medical attention. He, she was given the antibiotics, but I was worried about her gut microbiome. And, you know, there were so many horror stories of, um, that I'd actually seen as well in my clinic of kids that had developed chronic fatigue and, you know, hadn't really ever picked up from it. And I, so we really worked hard on that. And she did pick up really quickly, thank goodness. I think, you know, she is a very vibrant young girl. So I think she's lucky in, in lots of ways, but I think the nutrition really helped. And, we didn't have any ramifications afterwards with the antibiotics because six weeks of antibiotics is a lot for any young person to take. Mm. And then my little one, um, he was born a little bit later on. Um, we had a bit of a gap and he had a cow's milk protein allergy. And um, so that was another challenge that we had. Um, I mean, it wasn't nearly as extreme as the other two, but um, it was really, um, you know, something I had to think differently and feed, feed him differently. Um, but also he was put on Nutramagen, which is a formula which was great. He meant he wasn't sick and it gave him the nutrition he needed. But at the end of the day, it's a highly, highly processed formula with lots of glucose syrup and vegetable oils and things that aren't real food at all. So I was got his weaning really, really sharp. The other two I'd been a bit more laid back about, but this one I was really on, on it. And he is definitely our most adventurous best eater by a long way. And amazingly and I don't know whether this is going to happen anyway or whether the probiotics and the bone broths and all that helped but um, by three he was able to tolerate all milk and he's now you know he absolutely loves all dairy and he's great and we do he doesn't have seen any problems whatsoever so um yeah three little stories my three little people who are now quite big people um but yeah I know and that's really where I got my passion from I thought gosh you know there's so much that can be done and um, I just want them to have a really normal, straightforward, easy life without sort of compromises. You know, I just think I just see a lot of my clients coming through the door and they're bringing you know, bags of different food because they, everyone's this free and that free. And so many supplements and, um, you know, having to, you know, th think ahead so often because of their anxiety or their OCD or their, whatever it might be. And. I just um, would love to, you know, obviously you can't help everybody, but nutrition can, really can count when it comes to all these things. Yeah, yeah. And so tell me about what you're doing now. What does your life look like and your business and, and, and kind of what services? Uh, you've written a book and you're writing another one. Tell me a little bit about that. Ah, uh, well, um, so yes, up until about four years ago, it was only me and I just had a long waiting list and, you know, I just tried to get more and more efficient, really. <laughs> <laughs> and juggle the kids and you know as they were getting older they needed me less and it was sort of got easier but still um we just you know my husband and I sat down and said this is crazy you know you want to reach more people you want to help more people but you really don't have time to do that what are you going to do and I said well I guess I better build a team um so we found two amazing practitioners to join us which was really exciting and that felt really fantastic and so nice to work as a team rather than just me um, and to share knowledge and to share you know and discuss clients together it was just brilliant it was just like revolutionary um, anyway we have been building a building since then and um, basically in the next two to three weeks we're going to be 19 practitioners right. <laughs> which is wow. crazy so we're dotted around the country we've tried to find people not just for their location because obviously their brains really count and they're you know, their emotional intelligence and all of that and efficiency and, you know, 
um, but actually where they are. So we've trying to find you know, a nature dock in most areas. Sadly, we don't have anyone in the Nottingham area at the moment. <laughs> But we'll see. But it's really, yeah, really, really exciting. So that we built the team. So we're all specialised in women and children's health. We do see some men too. So we don't exclude them at all. But we just tend to see more women and children. Um, and that's been really great. And then, as I said, we built um, an online shop. With my husband and I run together. He's mainly, mainly sort of, you know, the head of the ship of that, if you see what I mean. And um, so that's called Nature Doc Shop. And we decided to create a sort of hand-picked collection of supplements and foods and, you know, free from foods and lovely stainless steel water bottles and, you know, eco things, lovely, you know, bamboo plates and things like that um, for families. And, you know, so that's been really fun and a sort of different angle to life. Anyway, when we were sort of building the team, I said, well, I want to write a book. He goes, well, you have to build the team first. And I was going, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> you know? So anyway, and um, I did, you know, go around and, you know, speak to a few publishers, but, you know, didn't get any bites as such. And yeah, then, yeah, three years ago, I suddenly got this email um, from Short Books. And they said, we love your blog. Would you consider writing a book? And by that point, I'd sort of half written one and a friend had taken some beautiful photos of my kids and my nephews and nieces. And I just thought, well, you know, I might self-publish or make it into an ebook. I'm not quite sure, but, you know, I'll do it somehow. And so they suddenly said, well, actually, yes, we really want to turn this into a proper book. <laughs> which is exciting. So, um, yeah, so the good stuff was published in 2018 um, and it's a. It's got lots of basic nutrition guidelines, all the things that, you know, I, we do every day for our children and sort of, you know, just, I guess, getting it clear on, you know, carb, carbohydrate intake, protein intake, omega-3, iron, you know, whether you're a veggie or a vegan, you know, what to do for that, immune system boosting, you know, all those kinds of things. Yeah. And then there's about 110 recipes or something yeah. in the back, which are beautifully, beautifully yeah. photographed. Um, yeah. So everything looks amazing. So that's now, great. And so listen, yeah. to, before you go on, um, you know, you, you've said a lot that I want to unpack for people. So you, <laughs> you, you, make, you make some assumptions there where you're going, you know, just getting the micros and the, the macros right. Just just outline for somebody because we know like 57 percent of our calories as a nation come from highly processed food. And I think we're both in agreement that probably the biggest thing that we could do as a nation is just getting back to real food, you know, things that our great grandparents mm. recognize. And, and the problem with highly processed food is that it's often devoid of a lot of really valuable nutrition. Um, and it's, and it's often sort of referred to almost as empty calories, as well as, you know, the other things that are added to it that our body just is adapted, you know, to, to using. And, and so, you know, I think for some people, you know, just even getting the idea of their kids off processed food on real food, you know, is the first step really. But but outline for me what you think Absolutely. are what you know, what are the guiding principles around feeding our um, kids well? And um, and then I would love to pick up also just on the gut because you talk a lot about that as well. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, I have very simple principles when it comes to food. Um, and I think they are very aligned with your, your principles too, which are basically cook from scratch as much as you can. Now, most people would say, yeah, I do that. But then think about breakfast. You know, you probably poured the cereal out of a box and you took your milk, which was semi-skimmed and homogenized. Um, and then you put your jam, which was in a pot with some margarine on some bread that you took out of a packet. So actually, even though you think you cook from scratch, a lot of the food that you're eating is probably made by someone else. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying you have to make every single jam. <laughs> you don't need to make every single thing that you eat um, because that would be really hard um, to do these things. What can I do to make that food a bit more nutritious, a bit more natural, a bit more nutrient dense as such? So, for instance, um, with bread, I often say, well, why don't you swap to a good quality sourdough that's maybe got some wholemeal grain in there? There might be some rye and there might be some spelt. And look at the look at the, the label and how many ingredients has it got on there? Because you can get ones which literally say spelt flour, yeast, salt and water. 
Okay, but you can get other ones which have 25 ingredients with emulsifiers, preservatives, etc. And those aren't so good for you because, of course, those are ultra processed and they're quite pro inflammatory in nature, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But, um, and again, with cereals, say, well, okay, if your kids are absolutely hooked on cereals, see what, what you can do to maybe give them a smaller bowl and then give them something else at breakfast. And even better, swap to a porridge, um, or you can make a granola, um, or, you know, there are some reasonably good granolas out there too. So, you know, keeping it a little bit more natural and a little bit more simple. And then, for instance, instead of going for margarine or, you know, utterly butterly or whatever it's called, um, you just go for a really good quality grass-fed butter. So it could be a Kerrygold, it could be a Guernsey butter. One that's yeah. more yellow is, is best because that's got lots of vitamin A and vitamin A is really important for your gut health and your eyes and your immunity and so many different factors. So, um, and yeah, I think butter is pretty special stuff. So it's things like that and probably getting a good organic jam. Um, you know, yes, it's got sugar in it. I'm not so much a sugar Nazi. I think lots of people are really anti-sugar, sugar, sugar, sugar. But when you break down food really into the nitty gritty of food, there is a lot of sugar in fruit. There's a lot of sugar in carrots and potatoes. It all manifests as sugar in the body. So if you get into anti-sugar, you basically need to go keto, which is really extreme. And I don't advise that for a child um, unless they are under medical care for epilepsy um, so really it's really really hard to avoid sugar entirely um, and actually I think it's almost better to have a tiny bit of sugar to make some very bitter fruit taste a bit sweeter yeah. um, than to buy some you know saccharin filled you know low sugar I don't know, cordial or fruit puree or whatever so um, personally I think that a little bit of sugar even better to go with honey or maple syrup or some coconut sugar, which yeah. are lower glycemic, so more less impact on those blood sugars. Let, basically, stop the blood sugars going all day. They sort of make them even out a bit better. Yeah. Um, so I try and go with those because they've got a little bit of zinc and a little bit of other nutri nutrients in there that are helpful. And you don't need so much because they're quite strong. So you kind of think, well, if you're making it yourself, you've got a lot of good ingredients in there. Yeah. Um, and as I said, um, if you do need to buy stuff, just look at the label and say, does this really, really look like food? Um, and when you analyze it, usually it means you buy, um, you know, and also the quality of the food as well. I mean, I know we've all been in lockdown and it's been really tough. And, you know, I've definitely done a supermarket run once a week and been less reliant on local food, but I would love to do more local food going forward. Um, but it's things like the eggs, you know, I try and just get, I know they're a little bit more expensive. I try and get the best quality eggs, at least free range, hopefully organic. Um, the same with the milk. I try and get this sort of air share blue topped organic rather than um, any, anything else. And the reason for that is because, first of all, you need the fat. The fat's more satiating. And if you go into proper medical research on fats and saturated fats, you'll find that actually there's less impact on weight gain, there's really not a problem with cardiovascular risk. And actually people are satiated, they're less likely to snack, so your kids will be fuller for longer. So I'm a big fan of good quality whole milk. And also in that organic milk that's been grass fed. So the really important thing is what the animal has fed on. So grass is better than grain in terms of nutrition, because that grass will give the will will give will give the cow or the pig or whatever it is, um, you know, that the ground will give them much more um, omega-3. And omega-3 is really important for the brain. It's important for emotional regulation. It's important for eye health, eyesight, et cetera. It's really, really key. And then, of course, if they're outside, they get the sunshine. And when the sunshine is in, D, in the meat and in the, in the milk. Um, so this is why it's really, really important to try and get organic, full fat, blue top milk if you can. And even better, there is some, it's quite difficult to get, but you can get from some farms, the Guernsey or the Jersey milk, which is super creamy and super good for them. But, you know, that is a little bit more expensive and harder to get. So if you're going to the supermarket, just get the best quality organic you can get. And that you can get that from most supermarkets now because there is such a difference in the nutrition. 
So there's this, I mean, they're fairly simple messages, aren't there? Like, um, you know, getting, you know, our kids just back onto real food and whole food and, a, a le- you know, the least processed as possible. And I'm totally with you on there in terms of the science and, you know, how we feed our animals, you know, and keeping it as, as simple as possible and keeping the food as whole as possible. I just think it's echoed throughout the research that our body knows what to do with that and has done for thousands of years. And then this sudden shift in the last 50 or 60 years to food that's unrecognizable, we've really struggled to adapt and, and it's having a significant impact you know on our health now just talk to me just lead into about gut health as well you know so again just setting the scene for some people that might be new to this like our gut you know has trillions of bacteria in it and certainly I don't know about you Lucinda but when I trained in the 90s like we didn't we didn't know why what they were doing we actually thought bacteria were bad um you know I grew up in a time where it was all about dental and hand washing and you know don't let your kid (laughs) eat dirt and and but actually now we understand over the last 10 or 15 years that these bacteria do incredible amounts especially you know for all of our health whether that's kids or adults and that and that we need this nice diverse robust sort of colony of bacteria and in exchange for us feeding them well and looking after them they do a host of really important jobs for us everything from uh, you know looking after our mood our sugars our cholesterol um, you know our immunity like there's so much that that they're doing for us so and we've we you know we have seen you know through the change of how we eat you know the impact of sleep deprivation the impact of our birthing techniques and you know bottle feeding that that there's an impact on our gut microbiome and the consequence is is an impact on health you know talk to me about you know the the gut microbiome and food from your point of view because I often start with the gut when I'm stuck and I don't know what to do in clinic I start with the gut because often a lot of things get better but just just reflect your experience of that too Lucinda. I totally agree we always start with gut too and we run lots of stool tests from our clinic yeah. As I said, a bit like the one I did for my son, um, we, we've got, we a- have access to quite a few different labs now. And um, the microbiome research has just gone boom. I mean, in, I mean, obviously in the last year, everything's been a little different. Um, but in 2019, there were over 15,000 papers published on PubMed right. um, on the gut microbiome and literally linking it, the importance of it to everything from type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, MS, depression, anxiety, autism, um, you know, the full Monty. I mean, there's nothing that escapes, you know, and there is, so you've got, <clears throat> you've got your gut microbiome. So you know about the, we've just talked, you've just talked about the billions of bacteria in the gut, but there's something called the, the gut brain axis. So there is a link between that gut bacteria and your brain. And I'm going to talk about that a lot more in a moment because it's something I'm really passionate about. You've got your gut skin axis. So that obviously can impact your skin. So kids with eczema, um, kids with psoriasis, you know, uh, rashes, histamine rashes, etc. That could all be very much linked to their microbiome. So I always say itchy on the outside, itchy on the inside. So you have to work on their gut first to get over the eczema. Yeah. Um, or to make it much better anyway and then you've got the what what do you mean when what, when you say working on the gut help somebody who's you know not medically trained what does that yes, mean yes exactly so I was just yeah but I was just going to say there's also the the gut lung axis and of course that's yeah. something that's been very prominent in the last year because of covid so i just wanted to share that there are many different microbiomes and we've got microbiomes in our vaginas in our noses you know in our ears we've got you know that it so these colonies of bacteria are important for all sorts of health so it's not just the gut that's really what i wanted to say um, but it all links back to the gut so if you get the gut healthy then the rest of the body falls together too so it's really important to get it right so when we're born we are born with a pretty sterile gut And as we go through the birthing canal, we pick up partly mum's microbiome from her vagina. And that helps to start building that microbiome in the gut and, you know, through the rest of the system. If you have a caesarean section, then there's less of that that happens. You end up 
picking up more of the bacteria from the hospital room and from home rather than from your mummy. Um, but anyway, it does build. It just takes a bit longer to do it. And so there's there's um, school of thought that if you are C-section, that is a good idea to take some probiotics, you know, to give the baby probiotics when they're tiny, just to sort of try and build that microbiome up sooner, quicker. Um, anyway, so that builds. And the first one that really builds in the gut is something called bifido infantis. And this is one that protects you from infections. So it stops you getting bacterial infections, viral infections, all the things that we're quite scared of when babies are tiny. Um, but also it helps to build tolerance so that by the time the baby's weaned, they're able to start, you're able to start introducing foods without being allergic to them. And it also helps to build tolerance to the milk that they're having, whether it's breast milk or, or formula. Um, however, if mummy or the baby have antibiotics in those first few months, sometimes they can all be wiped out and you have to start from scratch again. And of course, the baby's only getting milk at that point, you know. So, but what's really interesting is there's a channel between mummy's tummy and the back of their breasts. And these dendritic cells are really cool. They basically go from mum's gut up to the back of the breast. And then that, so her microbiome feeds, goes into the breast milk and into the baby. So if mum's eating really, really well, lots of fruit and veg and nuts and seeds and olive oil and all these good things for the microbiome and you know, yogurt and so forth, it's going to then help replenish her gut, which is then going to replenish the breast milk. But if, you know, mum needs to be on lots of antibiotics for whatever reason, um, or they have depleted anyway, because maybe they've had morning sickness during their pregnancy, so they haven't eaten particularly well, you know, whatever, you know, there's so there's, there's no judge, judging, it's just basically, you know, you know, it's what has happened, you'd have to look at the story. Um, but also remember, if a baby's on a formula for, for whatever reason, and many babies are, that um, they do now, most of the formulas add prebiotics, which feed the probiotics, but it's only a very small amount. And there are a couple which do actually add a probiotic too, but not many. So you've got, you know, they've only got that chance to build those probiotics in their first six months with milk. Um, and then once you're feeding them, once they're weaning onto solid foods, then you can start building microbiome more. Yeah. But basically, it's all about creating a really healthy immune response because the immune response will prevent you from getting allergies, colds and coughs, COVID, viruses, whatever it might be, parasites, but also, um, yeah, sort of other autoimmune issues going forward. So if you've got an autoimmune history in the, in the family, then you do want to work harder on the microbiome when they're little. So it's thought that the first thousand days is really important to get that microbiome right. So that's during pregnancy in the first two years of life. Yeah. Um, and so that's why, it, you know, as I said, I got sort of rather su super hooked on the whole weaning thing when my children were tiny, especially my little one, because of his tummy mm -hmm. and um, knowing more. And I just like really wanted to get it right then, because I thought if I can form his, Im his immune system now, then he's going to be healthier later on. Yeah. And there's lots of research to say that those thousand days, if you, you know, they look at they they you know they look at the microbiomes of the mummy, they look at the breakfast baby, and then they take that data, and then you know, ten years later, twenty years later, they track them and see what happens, and they find that you know certain bacteria that maybe are misdirected, so ones that shouldn't be there or ones that are depleted, that's that skew can lead to the depressions, the anxieties, the learning difficulties, you know, the autoimmune diseases, etc. So if you can get it right early on, that's going to set them up for life. Yeah. But it's never too late. And there's a lot of people go, oh, my God, but I've got a seven year old and they want antibiotics every single you know, day of their lives. So they're three of oh, yeah, have I ruined their lives? Said, no, you haven't. So basically, our bodies are very adaptable. And as I said, we sometimes see women who have literally never looked after themselves. They've lived off I know, burgers and chips and pizza and smoked and drunk. And suddenly they're like, oh, I've had a crisis. And they might be 35, 45, 55 or whatever. And we can still turn them around. So anyone can turn around. It's just a bit harder. It takes longer. And the immune system sometimes has memory cells. that goes, no, I don't want to change too much. Um, so but we can, do, we can only do our best. Tell me, Lucinda, you're, you're writing a book at the moment about weaning. So I know we've got some of the names I recognise. They've got little babies. They're still breastfeeding. Um, you know, what are your tips around weaning? Um, what are your overriding messages regarding that? 
So this is my second book, which is coming out on the May the 20th. So it's at the printers, it's, you know, which is really, really exciting. It's beautiful. It's absolutely the cutest little book. It's amazing. And again, it's got about 120 recipes and it's just gorgeous. Anyway, um, so again, my, my tips are to try and feed your baby as much of the same food as you eat. Yeah. So it's all about family food. Yeah. And that's sort of because I think I, I keep on mulling this over and I just... I, I now sort of look at all these pouches and pots and they're just literally, you know, there's apple and pear or apple and butternut squash. And they're, they're very, very simple foods. And actually babies can do a lot more than that. And so we've got some really exciting little, you know, even the first ones are sort of, you know, blueberries and kefir um, or turmeric and mango and, and flax seeds. And you know what I mean? We've got these really, really cool combos and a lovely... Um, yeah. chicken liver pate yeah. with um cranberries and sage um and a lovely black bean pate and do you know what I mean these pates that basically are mushable so you can either do a handheld so like a baby led you know on yeah. on a little cracker or yeah. they can have it straight off the spoon um yeah so it's really cool and then it progresses to you know fish pies and really nice kind of little cookies and things like that they can have when they're a little bit older so yeah no it's really really cool but basically it's all about pulling the baby up to the table, eating together as much as possible. Now, I know in reality that's not possible. There are naps sometimes at funny times, but at least if you're only cooking three meals a day rather than trying to cook six meals a day, it's a bit crazy, especially when you've got this little person that's only eating about three mouthfuls to begin with. You know, it seems a lot, a lot of hard work when you, they can have, as long as you don't have salt or honey and they can't choke on it, that's pretty much the only principles you have to stick with um and what's great about when you're weaning and cooking from scratch yourself is that you can adapt your baby's diet to what they need at that time so if they're looking a bit pale and pasty um you can give them some more iron rich foods if they're sneezing and snuffly you can give them more vitamin c rich foods you know it's uh, if they're not sleeping that well you can think i'm trying to get some more protein in before they go to bed so it's and a bit more fat to help them sort of sleep better so it's all those lovely you, you can make it so adaptable and it's yeah and also my other passion is I'm a herbalist and um I'm just really into my culinary herbs as well as medicinal herbs but culinary herbs are really important to me so again I think baby food should be really tasty um so there's quite a lot of you know as I said the turmeric, the rosemary, the garlics, thyme all these really really important herbs that are really good for the immune system too and help again the immune system be stronger so you, you're less reliant on on the big bad guns like the cow poles and the antibiotics that you know you want to keep to a minimum I mean they are lifesavers and they can be really useful but as little as possible really um I know with my um my first child so my first child was born in Africa um, in Uganda emergency cesarean section Amazing. And, um, you know, and she wouldn't be here today if she didn't have a C-section, but, you know, gut issues and allergy have been an ongoing problem that we're still working with at times. She's doing brilliantly. Um, but I remember when we moved back to this country, she was um, two and I also had another little one who was 10 months at that point. And when she was one, she weighed 10 kilos. And when she was two, she weighed 10 kilos and she was totally skeletal and um, completely you know there's a whole thing about food refusal and I think it was her way of we'd moved country when we arrived back in this country my youngest got very sick and I ended up in hospital so I wasn't there and so we had this terrible time where I was doing mm -hmm. the, you know home cooking and you know and you stand there and you've you've, you've made you know your food and and um, and I but back then um, you know she kind of ate on her own and then my husband would come home later and we'd eat together later and uh and I was just tearing my hair out I just didn't know what to do and one of my friends gave me this beautiful bit of advice which has stayed with me throughout my parenting and it was um Sally what does she see you do and uh, and I was like well she never really saw, saw us eight because I was always preparing her food it was the same food as us and I used to do that little thing where I used to put it in ice cube trays and then I'd save it you know for another day and um and so uh, but she never saw us eat. And for me, it was a real revelation 
in all aspects of parenting that actually they're watching us and actually when we sort out our own stuff you know they they will often do what we do and and so actually you know what I started to do was just eat with her and took the focus off the food like instead of just the the tension that was in me because I was so afraid as a first-time parent that she was skeletal and everybody told me she was so ill um, you know, it, it became about us being together instead of her eating. And, and then mm. it, it took months, you know, I, I remember it was like October time. And I thought, right, by Christmas, I'll have her eating a Christmas dinner. And it wasn't. It was the following <laughs> Christmas. And, and it took wow. the time to change behavior and her to get a confidence back and me to get my confidence back. Um, but, but I think realizing that food is so much more than just nutrition isn't isn't it i mean i think as a nation we have a huge thing to do to help us understand that nutrition matters you know a lot of people don't realize um and then you know also realizing it's more than that it's what gathers us as families and um i say i i mean i i've loved i mean the one thing i've loved about this year is that we've eaten together every single evening and most lunches as well but i'd say every single evening you know without fail and it's just been really brilliant to bring us all together what and a lot of people are like great you know i am all for home cooking but they're having real issues around food refusal and tantrums can mm. you shed some light maybe on your approach or some tips that maybe a mum could get hold of that might help with that i know my thoughts but i'd love to hear yours so I'm um, first of all, from, you know, as a practical perspective, yes, as I said, you know, lead, lead by example. So if you're sitting there, you know, drink it, drink a cup of tea and having a chocolate biscuit, whether you're expecting them to <laughs> sit down and eat their broccoli, it's just not going to happen. OK, so first of all, do sit down with them. And actually, you know, even if you have a tiny little plate and you're going to eat later properly, you know, just do and just have, you know, eat the vegetables, because if they see you eating vegetables, they'll eat vegetables. Um, the other thing is, which I think is really important, is um, to say which would you prefer. Right. Um, and it's it's just something I picked up on. I just remember my son. We had um, a bit of a birthday party, and I, you know, went around the table and said, you know, would you like peas or cucumber? And they all said, I don't like peas. I don't like cucumber. And then my son said, Oh, I prefer peas today, Mum. Thank you. And it was like, Ah, that. See, I've always done that. I've always done which would you prefer. And I, it sort of hit me in, in the face. I thought, my gosh, you know, and I think what happens is children have this thing that they can say they don't like something. And I often say to children when they come to the clinic and it's, it's, I often say, you don't need to like it yet. And it's like, it means that one day you probably will, but it's, it might take a bit of time and that takes the pressure off too. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's also the other thing that we used to do a lot was, um, because we were eating with the children and you know at the end of the day my husband got a bit bored of pasta bolognese or shepherd's pie or whatever it was all the time and that you know so um we often would put another big salad in the middle of the table or you know it could be a lentil salad or a rice salad or you know a green salad or whatever and you know it would have some interesting things like some feta or some pomegranate or whatever in there and it would be really interesting to see what the kids would pick out and try um and we didn't force them to eat some of that but you know they you know they had whatever they but you know they could see that they had the option to try it and then I'd often you know often you've got a little bit left in the bottom of the salad bowl and I just leave it and often you know within an hour of lunch or dinner being over it would all have gone and I just thought you know that's interesting you know I've turned my back and they're in there and so I just sort of think that's a really important thing too um but I understand, you know, in our clinic, we see the fussiest, fussiest eaters in the world. We see ones that literally eat two foods, you know, a, you know, a, a raspberry patty for loo and a breadstick. And that's it. That's breakfast, lunch, supper, nothing else. You know, so we, we do know that there are situations like that. And so what we try and do is literally just try and swap those two for something slightly more nutritious. So it could be um, an organic raspberry yogurt instead of the putty flu because at least it's real food um and then um we might go for a homemade breadstick or even a whole grain breadstick with some sesame seeds on it for instance that you know or something we try you know we slowly change things and then if you can make it from scratch even better so 
in my books, there are lots of things that, as I said, it's beautifully photographed. I mean, it's just stunning. But if you look at it all very closely, there's a lot, a lot of beige crunchy food in there. <laughs> It just looks really so basically, I think I've mastered the beige crunchy food that is really healthy inside sort of thing, tick and box. So we've got lots of, waff lots of waffles. Um, so in the new book, there is a cheese and chive waffle. There's a sweet potato, garlic and rosemary waffle. And then there's a beetroot and berry waffle. And they are just divine. They're crunchy. They're beige but they are yum, you know what I mean? And, and kids just love them because they love, you know, waff, you know, you just, you, you do need to invest in a waffle machine, but it really does. That's a key one. So they, my daughter's watching, you know, the crunchy day. my daughter's watching this and she's delighted to hear that we should be getting a waffle machine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, one of pancakes the pancakes are another winner. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Pancakes are another winner. So if you buy a pancake in the, in the supermarket or a waffle, it's usually white flour, vegetable oil and some white sugar and a few, you know, a few preservatives. And that's it. So in these pancakes or waffles, you can get yogurt, you can get eggs, you can get spelt flour, wholemeal flour, whatever. Um, you know, you can get grated carrots, you can get grated seeds yeah. in there. You know, it's just about packing in more nutrition yeah. into every bite. Yeah. Um, and you know, and it's it's great fun. I mean, I I love developing these recipes. Um, I did some focaccia this weekend, and I'm it was so, so wild garlic. I saw that. Yeah. Well, we've got all, we've got some wild garlic in the woods near us. So I've always been, you know, and we make endless pesto. But I thought I can't just do a pesto recipe. Everyone knows about wild garlic pesto. I was trying to wrap my brain on what to do, and I've been try I've been trying to master a gluten-free focaccia for ages that doesn't use loads of white flour or loads of gluten-free flour because I just think well that's just sort of very it's very carby yeah. um anyway um I kind of was playing around and it worked it was just so exciting first time and it's got ground almonds and chickpea flour as the base and it has some yeast so it re rose so it's all nice and fluffy um, and then I put the wild garlic in, but you can put rosemary, you can put sun dried tomatoes and basil, you know, all sorts of yummy focaccia yeah. things in there. Um, and I, you know, I had some at lunch and I literally didn't even think about food till supper time was normally on a Saturday. I'd be like, you know, looking for something sweet in the yeah. afternoon. So yeah, Lucinda, I've got a few questions. So, um, just to yeah. We've done quite a lot with babies and um, and I do encourage that like, people are asking a lot about how to encourage their children's gut microbiome. Um, and so I'd encourage them to have a look at your book, maybe, or your blog, um, you know, in terms of picking up how to do that. But on the whole, the, the key messages really are around, you know, good quality, whole real food is what develops a good gut microbiome and diversity, you know, trying to expose um, our gut to many different types of plants and seeds and nuts. Um, on the whole, people are asking about probiotics as a supplement. What are your thoughts on that mm -hmm. before we just move on? A lot of people are asking about teenage stuff, which might be nice to touch as well, but- um, Oh yeah, no, I could talk about teens, teens a lot, but I'll quickly talk about probiotics. Yeah. So as I said, we do a lot of stool tests which means that we get really amazing data on what's exactly going on in the gut. Yeah. And um, so we know what's missing, basically. And so then we try and piece together what will build in those things. So we've got lists of like which foods help to build which microbes, if you sort of mean. So we're really sort of hot on that. But sometimes we just know if it's so lactobacillus, I just want to talk about lactobacillus. It's so important for children. And it just, I just think it, it just brings it so much together um, with nutrition and health. Um, but um, we find that lactobacillus is the one that often is not there. So we get a no growth. So you get usually get the sort of sort of range from no growth up to four, and you want it to be at three or four, really to be abundant. And so we often get this no growth. And it was something that just kept on coming up over and over again. And of course, lactobacillus, you get from yogurt, you get from kefir, you get from lots of fruits and veggies and fresh foods um, and, you know, sauerkrauts, etc. So foods that, you know, lots of kids will have dairy, but there are lots and lots of dairy free kids around and a lot of people going plant based as well. So they're cutting out the dairy. Um, and of course, none of the plant based milks have any probiotics in there. Some of the there is some coconut yogurts and things like that with a few cultures. But not 
necessary. Um, I was sort of thinking, well, okay, you've got these. And then I thought, well, actually, a lot of these kids have taken quite a few rounds of antibiotics. And what do antibiotics do? They wipe out lactobacillus as the sort of most prevalent one to knock out. So we found this picture of kids who were dairy free and had been on very antibiotics because, of course, lots of kids with ear infections and so forth are very clogged up. And so the dairy can irritate that. So you can see why. So, again, no blame. But this is, you know, you can see this picture building. Anyway, I started um, learning more about actually what these bacteria do in terms of our neurotransmitters, which are our brain hormones. And there was this big wow moment with lactobacillus. So lactobacillus plays many roles. It helps you digest milk. It helps you regulate inflammation. It helps, you know, you digest food, et cetera. It's, it's really important. But it also is building blocks for two really important brain hormones. One is called acetylcholine. And acetylcholine helps with learning, memory, and emotional regulation. Okay. And it also, lactobacillus also makes GABA. And GABA is your inner yogi. It's your cool. It's your calm. It's your chilled out person. And we suddenly realized that so many of the kids that we were seeing with anxiety, OCD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, all the ADD, all these working memory issues and anxiety issues, they all had this very low lactobacillus. So we started working on those to build it up. And as I said, sometimes they had to be dairy free versions and sometimes we had to put the probiotics in because we knew we couldn't get it in through food or enough through food or they tried really hard through food and it wasn't enough. Um, so this is where I'm really passionate about getting lactobacillus in and there are very many different strains. Um, on my Instagram um, and Facebook, etc., and also on my blog, I do write quite a lot about specific strains. So um, I was literally just yesterday, I wrote a blog and just quickly just on lactobacillus and a uh, bifido strain. There's one called lactobacillus uh, rhamnosus GG. Um, it's a very specific one. And this has been identified as one strain of lactobacillus that really helps to bring down allergies and allergy potential, so eczema, et cetera. And then there's uh, bifido lactis, which is another one. And there's been really good research on those two together. So anyway, I did lots of research on basically why babies are becoming quite allergic and quite eczema -y, and it's not just genetics. And I was bringing those together. So those are two very specific ones that have been evidence. So basically, I guess what it is, is in terms of probiotic supplementation, we do recommend it quite a lot because it's quite hard to do through diet sometimes. And sometimes we find such specific needs that we just want to kind of pop that one up because we don't want to pop the other ones up. And so we do put those in from a clinical perspective. Um, but anyone can message me um, and, you know, if they want to sort of get some guidelines on a probiotic, I'd be really happy to help. Yeah. And, they, and just to help people understand like probiotics, um, they're not just one thing, are they? There's different strains, different strengths, you know, um, different delivery Absolutely. systems. And, you know, and there's so every time I prescribe a probiotic, I often have a quick link, you know, glance at the gut, at some of the research to see what was it the researchers were using what you know you know in terms of because because they're all so different it's not just about taking a probiotic sure. and sort everything out and actually some probiotics can really upset tummies as well so there is a bit of a wisdom about how to use use them well um and um so i've had a few questions so about skin and yes. eczema and kids with eczema and allergies I've had a few mm -hmm. people sort of note there what we are seeing a lot of allergies what's your your approach and thoughts and 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 about parents doing their own elimination and what are your thoughts around that and so I do think that there's quite a lot of evidence with eczema that the two key allergies allergens that seem to trigger the eczema the most yeah. are milk and eggs mm. so those are two things that you could trial but you would only trial them for a maximum of six weeks yeah and if yeah. they made no difference then i would go back to those foods because otherwise your body is going to become depleted and you know it's really hard to get the same nutrition like for like it just is you know i've analyzed and analyzed all these milk um, swaps you know all these plant-based milks and they just don't have, you know, no one's, no one's nailed it yet, you know. 
So, um, and eggs, you know, are full of choline and all important things for the brain. Um, so yes, you can swap that for peanut butter and sunflower seeds. You have to be really knowledgeable about that, you know, and a lot of people just take things out and you know, go to the supermarket and literally do a lot. They think they're doing a like for like swap and they're not. So I would just try that for six weeks. And normally most kids would respond quite nicely to that. They, they might not resolve the skin entirely, but it would, you would see definitely an improvement. Um, so yes, you can do that, but I wouldn't take it any further unless you did testing yeah. to, I mean, there's, there are lots of different tests you can do. I mean, there are mainstream allergy tests and obviously an allergy clinic could do that. We can do that with us at our clinic too. We don't do them in-house as such. We send you to proper labs to have them done, but they're the same that we don't do the skin pricks. We do the actual blood test for the allergies because we find that much more um, accurate and less stressful for in less time time consuming as well it's just a quick blood test we get the results back in two days and you you can literally do any kind of ones you want to you could do you know egg white and hazelnut and yeah. you know, feathers if you wanted to if you had three suspicions so it, it's really good you get really hone in on those um but sometimes it's not an ige allergy which is the mainstream sort of allergy that you associate you know with sort of swollen yeah. lips and throat and things like that and sometimes it is an intolerance and it's more of a you and a food intolerance is where you can eat something say on a Monday and you don't get the rash until the Wednesday or Thursday um yeah. so it can be a delay um and that's much harder to identify and that's where the elimination diets are, are sometimes better in terms of looking for intolerances yeah. rather than actual allergies yeah um I've, I've got a few questions i might ask so there's a, a lot of question about labels we've talked about organic grass-fed pasture-fed um you know and people and i get asked this a lot like what label should i be looking for and and i think sadly at the moment there isn't a label and um, organic is great because it will often be getting rid of a lot of agrochemicals that we might be exposed to it's a wonderful way um you know place to start but um grass fed a label as a label means that the ruminant has been fed majority grass but it doesn't mean that it's 100 percent and it still means it could be um, fed grain it doesn't mean that it's reared outdoors and pasture fed is when it's uh, the ruminant so that's your cows and your sheep have been uh, raised 100 percent on on pasture um but th there are some lovely um websites that i've become familiar with so pasture for life if you're looking for meat um, it's about 600 farmers around the country um, and it means they're 100 percent pasture fed um, and and then there's the regenerative farming movement which uses you know low chemical inputs um, sort of more the animals are often brought up sort of nature's way in their natural environment um, often fed their natural diet um, but there isn't a label for that at the moment but there are a lot of farmers who are regeneratively farming that are now online um, so there's a lovely website um, produce and provide UK which uh, connects small producers with us so we can buy that um, but and, and then there's just going to your farmer's market, there's going to your farm shop and it's asking like, you know, how are these animals raised? Where are they from? Um, you know, we, we need to start asking the questions because at the moment there, there isn't um, the label, certainly with chicken, you know, uh, again, ideally organic and, um, you know, sort of outdoor reared um, or, um, you know, is, is what we're after. But, but again, there isn't a particular label around that. Um, so it, it, it's a challenging time for us as a nation. And I think it's a beautiful time where actually we can start supporting amazing farmers and food producers around our nation who are who are farming nature's way that's good for the animal that produces nutrient rich food um you know and it's good for us it's good for the planet the way they farm um and there's an opportunity for us to actually start connecting with them but we're not quite there with the labels yet um so I just wanted to just put that little bit in there because people keep asking about all the labels. Uh, but certainly, and uh, we have a milk shed near us, Lucinda, which is wonderful. So completely- Yeah, we've got one about 15 minutes away too. Uh, so, you know, 100% uh, you know, grass fed, um, so pasture fed, um, you know, lovely old breed. Um, and we take our glass bottles that we wash every time and we go and fill it up. Um, 
and you know and it's 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 not homogenized so homogenization is where they break all the little fat molecules up and so it's all evenly distributed in the milk um and so yeah it's and it tastes amazing like my kids when they tasted it they're like I have never tasted milk before until this moment mum and it's like no it's true <laughs> like it's <is> really amazing <laughs> So, um, but yes, so just now there's, there's people moving on about, if you don't mind hanging on for a little bit longer, it's so wonderful. I'm learning so much. Um, just a little bit about um, acne and uh, kids and learn learning as well, kind of brain foods. I don't know whether we could look at that kind of some of those teenage topics you have time absolutely we have with as i said i've got one who's about to be a teenager and two two that are teens at the moment so um i'm totally in there we've got you know um uni exams a levels which aren't really happening and you know um yeah it's all happening here everyone's studying um so brain foods i think breakfast is the most important meal of the day for a teenager um and i know they sometimes skip breakfast um and it's hard so um, in the holidays, it's easier because it doesn't matter when they eat. But at school, um, I, I think sending them off with food in the morning well, and just hoping they will eat it at some point in the morning is a good idea. Um, as I said, trying to get more protein and fat in at breakfast. So that could be some butter, some whole milk, an egg or two. One of my top tips, which works so well, is cracking an egg into the porridge when you're cooking it. Oh, wow. And it makes it all lovely and creamy. It's so cool. It's so cool. And it adds protein and fat and they don't know it's there. Because you know how some are like, I don't like eggs. Or, you know, and um, so that's a really good one. You can get bananas and berries or you can put cocoa in or, you know, raspberries and cashews. I mean, you can put all sorts of things in. So it's really getting breakfast really right um, so that they start off their day. Because remember, they do all their academic work generally in the morning. Those are the main, you know, the main sort of thrust of all their lessons are in the morning. So getting breakfast right is really, really important for any age group, actually, at, at school or uni. Um, and then you can't really um, know exactly what they're going to have at lunchtime, especially at school. You know, I remember we sent my eldest to this lovely school in London, and partly because the menus just looked amazing, you know, sort of organic salmon and broccoli and quinoa or something amazing. And I thought, fab. And then, of course, every day I said, what did you have for lunch? He goes, pasta and cheese because he was allowed to choose whatever he wanted so I think it you know you don't really know and some some kids go out and buy food at lunchtime you know it's, it's really hard and some I find in the secondary schools the school lunches tend to be pretty dire um, so anyway um so you, that's why breakfast is doubly as important it's not just to get them through the morning it's also because they might not eat that well at lunchtime and there's often sport at lunchtime and extra maths or extra this so it's another sort of thing that gets in the way it's not seen as a priority time is to actually eat lunch um and then if you are picking them up from school um then to do you know try and find a healthy snack so what we tend to do at the weekends is we bake so we might make a whole load of muffins or, or biscuits or cookies or whatever and then i'll freeze them so I'll put them in a big bag and freeze them. And then um, literally I can pull them out of the freezer as I'm going to go and pick them up from school. And by the time I get there, it's they're defrosted. So wow. it's pretty easy to do, you know, um, and it's fun. And I get them and they love cooking at weekends. So it's just great fun. You can just get a recipe out and, you know, and they, they fire away. Um, so I think that's really important too. And then I think with the teenagers, it's also trying to get them into to bed in a reasonable time. And, and I know that's really hard and sort of giving them all those um, little tools like get rid of that phone before you go to bed, make sure it's out of your bedroom and all those screens out of your bedroom. So they do have a proper night's sleep because actually sleep is more is just as important for teens. And there's lots of theories that, you know, teens do need more sleep. And actually, they you know, there are some schools that have been trialing lessons not starting till 10 10 30 and you know they're actually doing better because that suits the sort of teen circadian rhythm um but still you know most people don't have that luxury unfortunately and um i don't know i mean anyone doing gcse's or a levels you know they're under so much pressure this year because they're having tests all the time because everything's being assessed there's not just one golden exam at the end you know it's every all the time so i'm seeing this it's this ultimate pressure and having not really been at school for a year it's even harder so 
so yeah so I, that's what I'm trying to do is to really help my kids with good night you know good sleep routines um, getting some fresh air every, every morning and also you know feeding them really well now I do get grumpy kids too and it's not perfect and I don't get it right every day but you, you know you can only yeah. try um, and um, you know it's just things like yesterday I, I said to my daughter uh, let's go out for a walk and she goes who's coming and I said, but just you and me, he goes, oh, okay, <laughs> I don't want to be my brothers, you know, it was just like, great, you know, and it was suddenly her treat, and we went for this amazing walk for over an hour, and we just talked about everything, and we just, you know, cleared the dust, it was great, so we came back feeling so much better, um, so little things like that is really lovely too, um, and um, so a lot of people want to know about sleep tips, um, because, um, so first of all, try not to get the caffeine in later on in the day, because obviously teenagers are often drinking tea and coffee. So again, try and educate them about how much time caffeine stays in the system, and it can be up to um, 12 hours. So, it, you know, it's, you know, if you last, if you have your last coffee at midday, it's still going to be in the system at midnight. Um, so that's that's an important thing and a lot of people end up eating chocolate after supper and of course that's quite caffeinated and people don't think about that so it's trying to keep the caffeine down um and then um in terms of you know they're often very hungry in the evening they like their snack attacks um so give them a really good supper as you would normally but things to that are good to have in the evening things like oat cakes or oats basically because they're quite soporific um and something maybe some nut butter or hummus or something that's not too sugary um so you could do carrots and hummus and something like that um and then it's getting them into a routine to get to sleep and one of the things that we've always loved and this isn't food but it's just the best best nicest thing is that we put two cups of epsom salts in the bath which are magnesium salts and so they basically you can't you know they just you know melt into the water so you don't even know they're there um and anyway, the magnesium gets absorbed into the skin and it really helps to relax the system. Yeah. Um, it does help a little bit with detoxification and liver support as well. So it's great. But it's really, really help, helpful for those that are a bit anxious, find it difficult to get sleep. And it, as I said, um, my middle one's very sporty. And um, so if she's ever doing, you know, a big tournament or whatever, she'll always come back and give herself an Epsom salt bath because it helps also with sort of lactic acid buildup and so forth. So it's really good for helping with sports injuries and things so kids really like it as well because it's like having a warm bath but it's just a bit nicer than having that um, you wouldn't put bubble bath or, or shampoo or anything because you absorb everything that's in the bath when you've got the Epsom salts in there so you just have to be a little bit careful um, but basically it's a really nice thing to do and it can help to get them more soporific um, and then things like you know warm milk um, with some turmeric and some honey and some cinnamon again anti-inflammatory and lovely and soporific and great or some herbal teas you know like pucker they do chamomile and night times and things like that and they're lovely and organic and good quality and tasty really tasty so there are lots of things that you can do to help them wind down with food and you know the right things so um listen you've been amazing so many tips there and um we haven't managed to get through half of the questions but i hope we've kind of touched on a lot of things um so um, i do encourage people that let me just i've got your let me just get your details up so people can just have a look um what did i do yeah let's have a look here so there you are. That's your website there, nature.clinic. Um, and that's your website. Um, and that's your Instagram uh, handle as well. So and that's your book there, your most your recent book, but not your new one's coming out, which is really exciting. Yeah, the um, new one's called I Can't Believe It's Baby Food. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. So um yeah so you know do hook up with Lucinda and follow a blog she wrote writes loads of great stuff loads of tips um, I'm always picking up things for my own girls um now our our next um uh, our next session is actually going to be looking at skin actually in more detail uh, and I have another guest um, Dr Catherine Steele she's actually an associate professor uh, in as a, as a psychiatrist but she has this massive interest in skin and skin care and clean skin care she also has some functional medicine um, training as well so we're going to come together the two of us I'm going to talk about skin from the inside out so I'm going to talk about food and nutrition and sleep and and how that impacts our skin um, and she's going to talk about 
the outside in bit because I know nothing about that. I have, I'm not very good with skincare. And so she's going to come and bring her expertise. And so again, you know, you can bring your questions um, and we can sit and kind of uh, learn from each other. Um, so do sign up for that. That's in a couple of weeks time. Uh, and again, my Instagram is Dr. Sally Bell. I, I'm blogging as well. And if you ever, Instagram's probably the best place to get me um, in terms of my attention if you want to ask questions I'm not so good on Facebook and LinkedIn but I am on there but um, but Lucinda it's been such a joy and um, and I just you know encourage you that uh, and people out there uh, to get in touch with you and your clinic and it's just great that we have people like you in our nation all working together for you know the good of the health for children so it's, it's so wonderful connecting with you and listening to you and all your great wisdom um, that you bring so thank you for taking the time out and for sharing all that with us um, and I'm sure we'll have another session I've had people already putting can we have a session on <laughs> so maybe <laughs> on, you know instead of another few months time we can dig a little bit deeper because there's so much isn't there um Oh my but, gosh, there's so much. <laughs> but thank you so much for being with us today and thank you um, for joining us today. I'll save the chat for you, Lucinda, and send it across to you just so you know. Um, but people can always contact Lucinda uh, through a clinic or, or, or on Instagram with your other questions. So thank you. Yeah, do please. I saw there were some really interesting questions and I'd love to hear from you and I'm really happy to answer them. So do get in touch, as I said, through nature.co.uk or my Instagram that would yeah. be great. Brilliant. So fabulous. Thank you very much.